Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this nice sunny day in Eastern Virginia. I wanna let you know, we greatly appreciate your support as members. And each year we spent, plan a few special opportunities to show you how much we really do appreciate your support and your commitment to what we do at the museum. So that's what today is all about. But before we get started, I wanted to just share with you a couple of things that are forthcoming um, in the near future. Many of you have been participating with us in our spring Muscarelli exploration series, Healing by Design. We have a few events left in that sequence. Please, if you um, need more information regarding them, check in at our website, muscarelli.org, or check your bulletin, your newsletter, which hopefully most of you have received, um, despite the good efforts of the Postal Service to keep you from receiving it. I also wanted to let you know that we are, as you know, continuing to work toward our renovation and expansion project at the museum, the new Martha Wren Briggs Center for the Visual Arts. We'll be having information sessions on the center in the coming four to six weeks. If you're interested in participating in one of those information sessions, one of the early ones, uh, please send me an email and you can find my email address also on our website. Well, I promised Elaine I would be brief in my introduction and recitation of all of the events going on uh, at the museum, uh, because this really is for you, our members, today's lecture. Elaine Ruffalo is an amazing person. You're all getting to know her. Some of us know her very well. I think I've known Elaine now for 11 years and have spent a lot of great times with her. I've been with her in the Vasari Corridor in Florence, I've been with her at the Villa Borghese in Rome. I've been with her at St. Mark's in Venice and many other places in those three or four cities across um, Italy. She's an art historian, long affiliated with Syracuse University and their program in Florence. She's led many, many groups on special expeditions around Italy and in certain specific cities. She teaches for Stanford University and many other universities. You all know her as a wonderful and engaging speaker. And quite frankly, we're lucky to have her with us today to share another part of her vast knowledge of art history. So Elaine, welcome. So great to be with you again today. Grazie mille, thank you so much. I'll share my screen. Let me unshare mine. Very good. And... There we go. This should be a good view. How's that? Very good? Perfect. All right, great. Well, so thank you so much, David, for that nice introduction. I feel like I'm coming to speak to family and friends rather than uh, a big organized or um, formal presentation. And I'm especially excited because uh, we'll be talking today about Padova or Padua. And I feel very close to that city because I actually used to live in Padua. It was my very first job um, after graduate school. I was running a program in Padua for a group of people called Elder Hostel, uh, which now has a different name. It's called Road Scholars. But uh, I lived in Padua for three years and was completely charmed at it. It's very alive. It's a young city. It's just filled with wonderful monuments. So when David asked me to do a presentation, I jumped at the opportunity to talk about Padua, saints, sinners, and Giotto. Um, so let's jump right into it because I've got a lot to tell you about. Make yourselves comfortable, get close to the screens. I've got some beautiful images for you. And um, we'll start talking about Padua. And I keep calling it Padua Padova. Padova is the Italian uh, word for, for Padua. Uh, and it is a famous city. It's famous because it's the place where Dante lived, where St. Anthony of Padua is buried. It's the setting of Shakespeare's Taming of a Shrew. And it has one of the oldest universities in the world. And last but certainly not least, Giotto's masterpiece, the Scroveni Chapel, is located in uh, Padova. So what we're going to do is take a quick walk through the city of Padua. I'm going to give you the highlights, and then we'll do a very careful look at um, 
Giotto Scraveni Chapel, which is one of those places, in my opinion, that everyone has to see once in their life uh, or more possible. It is up there with the most important decorative monument in a city filled with decorative monuments, uh, a, a country filled with them, as important, in my opinion, as Michelangelo's Sistine uh, Chapel. Well, let's jump into Padua. Here you can see the peninsula of um, Italy and where my little kind of oblong dot is. For some reason, I couldn't get it to be a circle, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the central location of Padua uh, is in, in, in the Veneto. That's the region that Padua is in. And it's on numerous rivers has meant that the area around Padua has been inhabited since at least the Iron Age. Uh, probably settled also by Etruscans, but really it becomes um, in and of its own when it was called Patavium. Uh, the Romans called it Patavium. And it was founded in 1183 BC. It's one of the earliest, that means it predates Rome. And according to the legend, Padua was founded by a Trojan prince whose name was Antenore, who uh, brought his people to the Veneto by boats, escaping the Trojan War. So it's a mythical founding, uh, which trumps basically Rome. Uh, its roots go back to the time of the earliest Greek civilization, even older than the foundation of Rome. Now, whether that's true or not remains to be seen. Doesn't matter. That's the myth. And uh, what you'll find throughout Italy, something that really hangs together uh, with commonality is that these city-states like to have some kind of mythical foundation that makes them as important as possible. Um, they even in Padua, as we're walking downtown Padua, you walk by this kind of interesting structure and you wonder what in the world is that thing? Well, it is the tomb of Antenore, the mythical founder in downtown Padua. Um, it has a kind of chaborium over it. Inside is this unmarked sarcophagus. On the other side, an early Christian sarcophagus. And this is the place where Antenore came and was buried. Between you and me, they did some analysis on the tomb, and it seems much more likely that it dates about 500 AD, which is brand new in Italy. But in any case, it does tell us that Padua is very proud of its past, and Padua Patavium was certainly once a Roman town, like so many other cities in Italy. Uh, Livy was uh, born in Padova. He tells us that it was founded in 45 BC, and that would correspond to just about the period of Julius Caesar. We're just getting out of the Ides of March, come to think about that. And that would make it a, a city that was founded just at the time that Rome is moving from a... Um, a republic into an empire. And it makes a lot of sense because these Roman towns were given to retired military. Uh, you got a plot of land, you got a stipend, and you got a nice place to live. And certainly Patavium was very nice to, uh, because of its location near the sea. Uh, it was important because of access to the sea. And it also has rivers going through it. One called the Brenta, which you've probably heard of with all the Palladio villas along it. And another river called the uh, Bacchelione River. It was famous for excellent horses. I like this um, old map of Padua. The Roman part is right here. You can always tell the Roman part of a city because there's a very clear uh, carde, decumanus, looks like a little bit like a chessboard. Here are the old walls. But what's interesting about this is you can see how the river and canals all run right through the heart of town. And that's not the case any longer. Uh, they have been filled in. But really, I think Padova would have looked much more like, you know, even Venice today, filled with these canals. Now, again, she was famous for um, 
excellent horses and wool. Those were the most important products of the city of Padua. Uh, and about 30,000 people. Okay, so what happens? Let's bring you right up to speed because there's not much left from those old days in Padua. Now, what will happen is that the Roman Empire is going to crumble, and it starts to crumble just about the end of the fourth and the fifth century. And uh, it crumbles for many reasons, corruption, overextension of the borders, the military starts to pay allegiance to the generals rather than to the emperors, but uh, by far, it's going to fall because of barbarians. And Padova, as an important Roman town, is going to be hit hard by Attila the Hun, the granddaddy of all the barbarians. The word barbarian comes from the term ba 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 babblers because Attila the Hun doesn't speak Greek or Latin. He's a babbler and he will pillage and plunder. Patavium gets invaded and then invaded again under the Goths and the Longobardi, the long bearded ones. That's Attila the Hun, or anyway, Delacroix's idea of Attila the Hun. Now, there's very little left of this period, except the remains of an old amphitheater. And this close up is showing that. And this is important for us because. Uh, it will identify why the Scrovegni Chapel is sometimes called the Arena Chapel as well. Um, that's all that's really left. And maybe some of the shape of the street grid will make it look very Roman. So where do the people of Patavium go? They go to two places. They head for the hills specifically the Euganian Hills, which are down here on the lower right-hand side. And they'll head for the hills for protection. They're very beautiful hills and they're all filled now with spas because the Euganian Hills um, is, a, is a prehistoric volcano and there's still uh, hot springs in those hills. The other place, of course, that the people from Patavium will flee will be into the Venetian Lagoon. And that's fascinating. They move into the shallow waters, the salt waters of the lagoon, shallow, so they could build islands on it. Islands are there, they build up the islands. And of course that becomes eventually Venice. So that's where people head and Padua will of course completely empty out. But don't worry, she'll come back. Now, those um, early days of Padua, you'll get the rise of city-states following this period, and, and Padua will rise up again just about the 12th century. And anytime um, you're looking at different cities in Italy, you should always ask yourselves, well, what was the economy that allowed them to get back on their feet again, uh, back on their feet again, following the period of the Dark Ages? And my answer to you is that Padova will flourish thanks to the wool trade, horses, and pilgrimage. Let's have a picture. There we go. Those are the major products of the city of Padua. And it will enjoy a period of calm and prosperity and she'll really enter into her golden age. There you can see the wool workers up at the top. Uh, they're gonna dye uh, cloth and wool. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the horse. That's actually, I took that picture from a presentation I gave a few weeks ago for you. It's in, it's in uh, Mantova, but to give you an idea of these, great horses. And then down below, you can see some characters who are on pilgrimage. Now, pilgrimage is a big money maker because these pilgrims need a hotel room. They need to stay somewhere. They need to, you know, have food. They need to buy trinkets. And Padova attracted pilgrims. It still does today uh, because it's the burial place of Saint Anthony, one of the greatest saints and um, even today on June 24th, which is um, St. Anthony's Day, the city is filled with pilgrims. All right, so she rises up again after the period of the Dark Ages, the population will begin to grow and we start to move into a period of, of really great prosperity 
in Padua. This is in fact the period that the university was founded. Uh, I think it's a little known fact that Padua boasts one of the oldest universities in the world. It's the second oldest in Italy and it was founded in the year 1222. It was founded by a group of students who were attending university in Bologna. Bologna is the oldest university in, um, in Italy. It was founded in 1221. And uh, they, they became disillusioned for some reason with their professors and they moved to Padua instead, which is not very far away. And they uh, began to meet here. And now the university is known as Il Bo, B-O, Il Bo. You can see it down at the bottom of my screen, uh, this, the University of Padua Detto Il Bo, because it was built originally on the site of an inn that was owned by a butcher that had a symbol of an ox over the entranceway. And the word for ox in Paduan dialect is Bo. I know that's convoluted, but it's, it, it really does exist. And even today, if you're walking through Padova, the University dei Studi di Padova, and you ask someone, where's the university? They're not really sure what you're talking about. But if you say, where is Il Bo? They all tell you where to go. And uh, here is what it looks like today. A lovely high Renaissance courtyard, um, Alantica. And it's famous because, as I said, it's the second oldest university in Europe. Uh, there are famous students who went or attended the Bow Galileo. He lectured here at the Bow. This is his lectern. Uh, that if you visit the university, they take you in to see this lectern with a bust of Galileo. Uh, this is where Galileo wrote his famous letter to the Doge of Venice, because at this point, uh, it's under the when when. When Galileo was there, it was under the auspices of Venice. And he wrote, um, he wrote a letter that, it, in fact, David was with me. We looked at this letter in person and it said, Dear Doge, I have a little something for you that you might find amusing. It makes boats from far away seem close up and that might be useful. He was talking about the telescope. And, and that was going on while uh, Galileo was living in Padua. I think that's incredibly inspirational. Um, so a famous students to say the university dates 1592 uh, to 1610. And even in downtown Padua today, there's a delightful uh, piazza uh, that's filled with an old moat kind of reflecting the fact that Padua was once filled with rivers. Uh, with all a series of 162 professors dancing on these plinths uh, going around in the piazza. Um, also, just to let you know that Padua has the oldest botanical garden in the world. For, for garden lovers, this is a must to see. It dates back to 1545, again, when Padua was under the control of Venice. Um, and together with Pisa's right there with it, Pisa's University and their uh, botanical garden are the oldest in the world. And, you know, the university, of course, today specializes in medicine that you say, a Padova si fa gran dottore, which means in Padua we make great doctors. And since 1595, Padua's famous anatomical theater drew artists and scientists studying the human body during public dissections. This is fascinating. And I know there's many medical doctors out there uh, certainly would find this interesting. And the structure that you're looking up here on the left-hand side, it's all made of wood. Um, the cadaver would come out here uh, and the students would take their turns moving around so they could have a good look and winding around all the way to the top and then back down again, uh, watching the dissection um, going on. So it's really quite an interesting endeavor. And here's just a, a smattering of some of the uh, famous people who have studied or uh, graduated or been professors at Padua University, which is the first woman to graduate from a uh, university. Elena Lucrezia Corner comes from Padua University as well. Casanova went there as well. Alberto Magnus. 
uh, Federico Fagin, Giuseppe Tartini, the great musician, Andrea uh, Vesalius, who, um, again, for dissection, fascinating. And William Harvey, William Harvey, in fact, uh, who figured out the circulation of the blood all from Padua University. All right, so we've got uh, that great monument. But then let's talk about saints. Il Santo. Uh, this is Saint Anthony of Padua. He was actually born in Spain, uh, or I'm sorry, in Portugal, uh, but he dies in Padua and he's always known as Saint Anthony uh, of Padua. He was a very close follower, of course, of Saint Francis. And he dies and uh, the burial place of Saint Anthony's is here. And it's called the Basilica of Sant'Antonio, but everybody calls it Il Santo. It's kind of like the university. It's called Il Bo. In Padua, you don't say the Basilica of Sant'Antonio, you say Il Santo, as if there's no other saint ever existed. And it is a site of great pilgrimage. People from all over the world uh, come to visit this, especially on St. Anthony's Day. Uh, I know this for sure because when I lived in Padua, I lived across the street from this, and it was a continuous um, line of pilgrims coming in. It was very heartwarming, too, because they were using the church, you know, not as a museum, but something living. And um, the construction of the building began just one year after the saint's death in 1232, and it was completed by 1310. And, and for the size of that thing, it's really quite um, uh, remarkable. Also, just looking at the structure, the architecture of the space, it's interesting because it has no precise architectural style. I mean, look at this thing. The, the, the domes at the top are reminiscent of St. Mark's in Venice. Looking back, the size of it, the, 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 the body of it is quite Romanesque. The brickwork looks like something you might see in, again, Northern Italy, Verona, or even a bit like Milan. And so you end up with this eclectic kind of architecture that you might not find pleasing, but it is certainly interesting. And it really lets us see that we are in a city that is a crossroads of east and west. Um, and stepping inside, oh, I wanted you to see this. I'm sorry about that big sign with the walking character here, but I took this because I wanted you to see down below all of these kiosks. These are all giant candles that the pilgrims will purchase. And then you bring them in here. It says Pellegrini, welcome Pellegrini. Pellegrini is the Italian word for pilgrims. And um, the uh, candles are brought inside and they're burned uh, by one of the Franciscan monks every day in uh, memory of whoever donated it. So it, again, used very, very well. This is the look of it. Over the skyline in the distance, you can see the Euganian Hills, fascinating. Now let's step inside. And what's interesting is that the outside is impressive, but so is the inside, completely filled with frescoes, gilding, sculpture, marble, uh, ecclesiastical furniture, bronze. It is a little overwhelming. And the term for this is horror vacui, which means fear of empty places. You do not see anything like this, say in Florence, uh, or uh, this, is, this is quintessentially uh, Padovano when it comes to the Santo. Now, the reason why everybody's coming is of course to see the relics of St. Anthony. Um, and uh, you come inside the church because it holds not only the body of St. Anthony, but specific body parts, which are displayed in these ornate kind of Baroque uh, reliquaries. And the things that they have at St. Anthony's are the chin, which we're looking at with his teeth still in there, um, the vocal cords of St. Anthony and his tongue in three separate containers. I realize that that seems a bit grisly, um, but this cult of relics is important 
especially when you consider the economy. So I'm an economic art historian. That's why I'm always interested in how these cities made money. And yes, wool and horses, but a big part of the money that was earned in Padua were all the pilgrims coming to see the tongue, the vocal cords, or the chin. Uh, so much so even today, in when I was living in Padua back in the early 90s, um, the tongue was stolen. It was stolen by a band of uh, thieves that held it for ransom. Uh, the people of Padua paid the ransom, and now the tongue is back inside its reliquary. What can I say? Now, artistically, the most important monument inside the Santo is by this man, Donatello, who is a Florentine. And Donatello uh, was very close to Cosimo de' Medici. Cosimo de' Medici gets kicked out of Florence in the year 1434 uh, because the Albizzi family trumped up some charges and he gets exiled from the city. Padua took him in and in order to thank Padua later on, he's going to send his favorite artist Donatello to do some creations for the city of Padova. Donatello comes, he doesn't like Padua. He said it's a city of fog and frogs, which is very nice. But in any case, he's going to work there for many years, look 1446 to 1453, and he does the high altar for the Santo, um, which I have to say the Franciscan uh, friars at the Santo are very generous in letting people come up and get a good look at this. It's hard to see from far away. It's even hard to see from here. So here's a nice close up. And uh, you can see Donatello's high altar, which is quite complex. Uh, these three figures are the most, I should say, four figures are the most important. And Donatello's doing these uh, right in the middle of his career, right in his high style. He's at the, the crest of his fame in Florence. He comes up to Padua where Cosimo sent him, and he does this really fascinating image of the Virgin Mary holding the Christ child. Next to hers, of course, St. Anthony and um, St. Francis. But let's look at the Virgin Mary. She's pretty fascinating. Her wonderful, she's wearing a crown with seraphims. It's this beautiful face. Look at the fall of the drapery in bronze. She looks like she's wearing milk chocolate that's melting over her. And she's seated in a throne with these two figures that look like sphinxes or harpies. They're supposed to see into the future as the Virgin Mary was born with all knowledge. She holds Christ and if you look carefully at her, she is just standing up. See, she's just starting and she's handing to the viewer the body of Christ, which is of course Corpus Christi. And Christ looks like a real baby, he's kind of chubby and he's just blessing out at us. So Donatello giving us um, a sculptural complex that we interact with visually. And then above her head is this astonishingly uh, moving and naturalistic um, image of Christ on the crucifix. Look at this. Looks like a Hercules Christ. Look at the emphasis on the body and how Donatello gives us the muscles, the bones, the sinews. Notice in his arm, pulsing with blood in the veins, elongated. The way the loincloth, by the way, was added on later, he should be a nude Christ reminding us that Christ is a man. And he dies on the cross, his, his head is just falling to the right. There's a, the vein in the middle of his forehead is emphasized. And we feel as if he's just taken his last breath and our eye caresses that beautiful body. He crosses the, the feet, which is an important detail because that way uh, he, the, the, the Romans crucified him this way so he couldn't hold his body up and he dies very slowly of uh, suffocation. So this suffering image of Christ mixed with a heroic image of Christ, I think is really just 
fascinating and indicative of what Donatello was interested in um, portraying in the 1440s. But let's go outside again because there's yet one more important uh, work by Donatello, which is a not to be missed, and that is the equestrian monument that you see immediately to the left of the facade. His name is Gatta Melata, and he was a mercenary general who fought for the Venetian Republic. And in the 15th century, Padua was under the auspices of Venice. Um, his he and his family wanted an equestrian monument uh, erected to him. And the Venetians are always reluctant to put any kind of monument in Venice to an individual. And the few times that they do, it's usually hidden around a corner and hard to find. So they try to appease him by uh, giving him a, a monument in, in, in front of the Santo instead of, in fact, in front of San Marco. Here, let's get up close. And what you're looking at, everyone, is this, the first life-size equestrian monument since classical antiquity. The theme is interesting already, classical antiquity and equestrian monument. The idea is that, that you can control a horse, you can control an army, shows your prestige, and Donatello cast this in bronze. Um, Erasmo da Narni, that's his real name, everybody calls him honey cat. There's a bit of a close-up. I realize that the pigeons have done their uh, work on this thing, but if you back up a little bit, you can make out the features and the figure. Uh, he's called Honey Cat, which is kind of a sarcastic way of calling a mercenary general. Uh, he was a killer. Um, he was talented. He signed his contracts, which is where the word condottieri comes from. He had a horse, as you can see, and a lance, as you can see, and he was free to work for anyone who paid him. It's where we get our term freelance, by the way. And as a freelancer, he would, of course, he was able to defeat the foes of the Venetian Republic, and that's why he has a monument um, in Padua. Uh, he, Donatello's cast this thing in the lost wax technique, which means that the equestrian monument is hollow, uh, he's trying to balance it out. He needs a little bit of help here. So he puts the uh, hoof on top of a, a cannonball. And uh, you feel as if this horse and rider are just ready to leave the piazza and go off on adventure. Even the silhouette of the figure, I think, is quite interesting how Donatello will emphasize these curves, the curves of the back of the horse's neck, the back of Gatemelata, the big rump of the horse, and that tied up kind of fancy tail emphasizing horses, this whole equestrian culture, which is so much a part of Padua. So that's Donatello, and there's this Florentine connection, certainly, um, between Padua and Florence. What are the connections? the wool industry, Cosimo de' Medici, the artists, and before Cosimo, Giotto. And here's Giotto di Bondone, born in 1267, dies in 1337, and he is certainly a quintessential Florentine. And he will go to Padua, uh, to work for the Scrovegni family. So let's uh, think about Giotto for a moment. He's born in uh, about 35 kilometers from Florence in a place called Colle Vesignano. Uh, Vasari talks about him and his lives of the artist. He said he was a shepherd boy and he was discovered by Cimabue uh, as a talent. And he was, he, was, he was a talented young shepherd boy who could draw a perfect circle with no compass. Tradition tells us that he painted in Assisi uh, with his teacher Cimabue, who you see here on your left. Cimabue in 1290 was the painter in Florence, Rome, Assisi. He was the last gasp of the Byzantine style. Have a look on your left. 
It's called the Maesta, where the Virgin Mary is enthroned and th surrounded by angels. The overall color is gold. She's wearing golden striations. It is incredibly beautiful, but incredibly Byzantine looking. It looks Eastern, almost like um, a Russian icon. Have a, a look with me. And you see every bit of the painting is filled up with golden details. Mary has an oversized head, elongated eyes. Christ looks a little bit like a mini man. Her elongated fingers, striations tends to flatten the figure out. There's no understanding of how the perspective works with the chair. And at the very bottom, you have these four Old Testament figures who look incredibly cranky uh, up at the Virgin Mary. But that's that old Gothic or Byzantine style. So when you look at what Jalto's doing, you see this enormous break um, from the Byzantine past into what I like to call the dawn of the Renaissance. Look, the Madonna has breasts. Those are the first breasts since classical antiquity. Get excited. Look, she's seated in some kind of a believable uh, throne with these two old figures, probably Old Testament figures, peeking from behind the gables, giving you a sense of space. No longer are the angels stacked one on top of another, but the angels' halos overlap each other, giving us a sense of depth into the work of art. Highlights and lowlights, an entrance for the viewer to come into the picture plane. So what you're looking at with these two paintings is the end of the Byzantine period, and on the right, the dawn of the Renaissance. Giotto is the man. Even Dante talks about Giotto. Look, Dante wrote in his Divine Comedy in Purgatorio, in Purgatory, uh, the Italians at the top, but once Cimabue thought to hold the field as painter, Giotto now is all the rage, dimming the luster of the other's fame. Now, it sounds better in Italian, but never mind. My point is that Dante, writing the Divine Comedy, mentions Giotto and Cimabue, which tells us that the artists are famous at that point and that Giotto will go beyond his instructor. Let's dig in a little bit more with Dante. By the way, it's the 700th anniversary of the death of Dante this year. He dies in 1321. So this is a big Dante year. Dante wrote the Divine Comedy and then he was exiled from Florence and he ended up publishing it when he was outside of Florence, uh, even though he's the quintessential Florentine. Uh, he spends the rest of his life wandering, he's the wandering poet, and he will go to Padua. Of course, who wouldn't go to Padua? There's the university, the, 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 the Santo. I mean, it's the place that is really happening at the time. And we know that Dante stayed in Padua. And we think perhaps um, Dante and Giotto knew each other, although uh, there's no documentary evidence of that. I just can't imagine a city at the time that was about 30,000 people, which is a big city in, in Italy at this period, with Dante and Giotto in the same city that they wouldn't have met each other. I mean, I, I think that's pretty uh, fascinating. And then there's an old legend that Vasari tells us that uh, Dante used to like to come to visit Giotto uh, when he was working in Padua. And um, unfortunately, poor Giotto was famous for being incredibly homely. And uh, he had incredibly homely children as well. And Dante would ask Giotto how he was able to create such beautiful pictures and yet created such ugly children, to which Giotto replied, very Florentine, I made them in the dark. All right, so now let's turn to the greatest, maybe the greatest of all the decorative monuments in Italy, the Scrovani. And here it is. 
one of uh, the, the, we're gonna read this thing carefully in terms of who paid for it? Why was it built? What's inside? And then we're gonna break it down to the individual frescoes. Now, one of the city's leading banking families was the Scroveni. So bankers and wool merchants in Padua, bankers and wool merchants in Florence. There's a real connection. And the head of their family in the late 13th century was a guy named Reginaldo Scroveni, who was charging about 15% interest on his loans, which is called usury. Dante, or Dante, uh, found him so objectionable that he put Reginaldo Scroveni uh, in um, a special place in his inferno and mentions him in Canto 17 as being uh, a particularly terrible usurer and devils excrete golden coins into his mouth for eternity. So that's not pleasant, but that's what happens to the head of the family, according to Dante, uh, after he dies. Now, Reginaldo Scroveni's son, his name was Enrico Scroveni, he continued to be a usurer like his father, but then he became a little bit troubled by the possible consequences of his actions. Maybe he was reading Dante. And in 1302, in order to expiate the sins of his ill-gotten gains, he began to erect this chapel, which is decorated to the Virgin of Charity. It was already known the area of the, this area as the arena. Let me show you a picture because it was connected to the Scroveni family. Now this is an old. Um, uh, woodcut uh, that shows you the old Scroveni family palace after many, I mean, it, the woodcut doesn't go back to 1300 after many renovations, but you see this must have been done in the 17th century by looking at the costumes. And you can see this building is the uh, palace of the Scroveni family. Mm -hmm. And here is the, right here is the Scroveni chapel. And then can you all see that the shape of the Scroveni Palace is taking on the shape of the old wall of the arena and the arena chapel is connected to it. That's why it's called the arena chapel. So people call it two different things, the Scroveni Chapel or the arena chapel and it's built on the remains of the old amphitheater that I mentioned, one of the very few uh, remnants of Patavium. Okay, so here it is. Now, uh, the, we have a document recording the dedication of the chapel was in 1303. And we also have a document that tells us there was indulgences granted uh, to anyone who came to um, pray at this place in 1304. Uh, to, so visitors could get indulgences. Indulgences means that you get time off of purgatory. Uh, and the chapel was formally dedicated on March 25th. So we're coming close to that date. That's Annunciation Day uh, to celebrate this, this image. Okay, so it's the function of this is a private chapel for a wealthy banking family. Now let's look at it architecturally because it's curious looking. But now that you realize where you see the tree on the left-hand side, that was where the family, the family palace was attached to it. And on the right hand side, you can see six windows with very little other articulation. There's a little bit of a blind arcade up here for decoration, a rather lovely little window up here, um, a door that's articulated with some white marble, but it's quite a plain brick fa facade and exterior. Uh, just the windows opened up to let light in. There's one idea that maybe Giotto actually uh, designed this because it's it's a perfect structure for frescoes. Giotto, uh, he does a design for architecture, but for the Campanile of Florence, but um, above all, he is a fresco painter. And the exterior doesn't prepare you for what you get to see when you step inside. And now in order to visit this chapel, you have to make a reservation 
you get there uh, 45 minutes ahead of time and you go into a kind of decompression chamber before you're allowed inside the chapel. Uh, you get completely decompressed, all the air changes. I always feel like I look much younger when I walk out of there. And then you step inside and this is what you see. Wow. Wow. That is the interior of the Scrovegni Chapel. And uh, Giotto paints this in 1303 to 1305. He might have been the architect for the chapel because in the end, the building is just a box designed to accommodate an extensive fresco cycle. Giotto was commissioned to paint the scenes of the redemption of humanity, beginning with the, annunci the uh, Annunciation to the Virgin Mary, again, that's the, the day that the whole thing was um, consecrated, all the way to Last Judgment. Now, um, let me just give you the things that we're going to concentrate on. I want you to watch for this as we go through the chapel. I want you to look for the empirical perspective, uh, the consistent depth of illusionistic field, human emotion, his color use, his composition, tableau vivant, meaning a kind of a, 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 a living stage, figures on a stage, and then Jacobus Voragine, the golden legend. I put that in because that's where the story comes from. This is not from the Bible. This all tells you a story that was written uh, right in the middle towards the end of the 13th century by a French monk named Jacobus Voragine. And the golden legend are wonderful stories of saints. They're apocryphal. And he tells the story uh, of all the events that are leading up to the crucifixion and last judgment, uh, which makes sense. Okay, so now let's jump into it. Here's another view. And the way that Giotto does this is he puts it together almost like they are uh, like a comic book almost. And you read the space. See my cursor on the upper left-hand side. Left, right, 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 across. Right, right, across, left. Round and round, like so. It's really fantastic. Now we start at the ceiling. Look straight up. And there is the Virgin of Charity. And she's in this field of blue and golden stars. That blue uh, is, is lapis lazuli, comes from an ultramarine, very expensive. And the golden stars are real gold. Uh, I mean, this was supposed to be the idea of charity. Well, certainly the Scrovegni families did not uh, hesitate to spend their fortune on the interior of this chapel. Okay, so let's start with scene number one. I'm not going to go every single scene, but I'll pull you through the story because the stories are really quite delightful. And this is the first story, which is the expulsion of Joachim. And again, this is from the Golden Legend. So Joachim is getting kicked out of the temple because he doesn't have any children. And the Joachim is the father of the Virgin Mary. And Giotto begins this scene, giving you kind of an interesting juxtaposition of the, um, the priest at the temple with their little hats. See, he's teaching a young uh, boy, and you get this interior space, and here's the other priest who pushes him, pushes him out. He's not even accepting the little lamb that Joachim brought to sacrifice. Look at the human emotion on that face, and this kind of interesting way that the priest has taken his garment and he's really forcefully pushing him out to this blue, this abyss. Giotto juxtaposes an interior kind of tender moment of instruction with the teacher and the student and kicking out this poor hapless fellow into, you know, into the blue abyss. And he's understandably depressed and Giotto moves us to follow Joachim, where he goes out into the wilderness to live with the shepherds. And how does he do that? He continues that blue, empty space. And then we come to Joachim, who's downcast. 
The shepherds look at each other suspiciously. Do we trust this fellow? Again, human emotion. The lambs are all coming out of their, um, their little protective hut. And if they're suspicious, this dog certainly understands that Joachim is a good guy and he comes bounding over to greet him happily. Now that's what's going on with Joachim. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, what's going on with his wife? Joachim's wife is uh, Anna, of course, and Anna is inside her home. Look at the interior of this home, how charming. Let's go have a look. You can see she has um, a wooden ceiling at the top. Uh, you can see the curtain uh, that's been drawn around to reveal her bed, which has a striped coverlet. I can see pots and pans, uh, a little shelf where she keeps her things. Notice the little cassone here and underneath, uh, certainly a bench of some sort. We call that a lettuccio. It's kind of a piece of furniture of a, of a, of a bed and a uh, bench all into one giving you this really interesting homey scene. And she is looking up at this angel who's coming in through the window. Uh, and she's excited because the angel has just announced to her that she's going to be pregnant. And, you know, that's a miracle because Anna's like a hundred or something when this happens. And that is a miracle. This angel comes back and tells Joachim to hightail at home because his wife is miraculously pregnant. I think this is, I love this image of Joachim, who's all wrapped up in these pink robes. Look at the highlights and lowlights and how you have this sense of three-dimensionality uh, for the figure who's sleeping. Look at the, the naturalism that Giotto uses to uh, paint these sheep. Perhaps Giotto was a shepherd, as, as Vasari tells us. Um, and the same little dog uh, looking very curious. Well, Anna and Joachim come back together again during something called the Kiss at the Golden Gate. And this is the first of many embraces I'm going to show you. Giotto uses the embrace to move your eye around the composition. So watch for it. This embrace is an embrace of love and concern. Look. The shepherds are following Joachim now. They're just coming in from the wilderness. I can tell because Giotto has cut that shepherd off in half, giving us a feel that one scene flows into the next. Here's the golden gate, literally gold. And um, Giotto uses the shape of that arch and he repeats it over and over again. Um, so you have the arch of the golden gate, the arch of the bridge, the arch of the opening bridge, and then the arch that's formed by the two figures coming together. These ladies are all pouring out from underneath the golden gate. They're laughing and excited. This woman looks troubled. She even looks perhaps a little evil. Who is this woman? Uh, it's, been try it's been interpreted by art historians for many, many centuries, trying to figure out who is the woman in black at the golden gate. Perhaps she is a Jew and she's looking away, but then again, Anna and Joachim are Jews. Perhaps she is um, a symbol of the, of the calamity that will befall the daughter of Anna and Joachim, the Virgin Mary. Or perhaps she's just a little embarrassed with all that smooching going on. Because what you see is this first kiss since classical antiquity. There it is, like a Hollywood smooch that these two, even their halos are coming together so beautifully. And you get the concern also, look at the way uh, Anna takes her fingers and she runs it through that gray old beard of her husband. Uh, he holds on to her shoulders to say, yes, we can get through this. Wow, that's love and concern. Okay. Of course, she gives birth to the Virgin Mary. Here we are back in her interior room, playing with this idea of interiors and exteriors. Now, the Virgin Mary, three years old, they promise to give her to the priest at the temple, Anna and Joachim, give her up to the priest, and she goes to live with the other little virgins who are inside the priest. Just back up and look at this scene for a minute, and notice what Giotto does. He weights that composition beautifully. He gives us the heavy side here with this big image of Anna, uh, a figure who's carrying a basket on his back. 
And then going up this diagonal staircase, he's got to balance the weight of the composition. He does so by giving the two figures on the right-hand side, shown from the back, giving us a sense of space. This little hand here is important. That gesture moves us back to the moment that the young Virgin Mary, three years old, she looks a little bit older than this painting, but she goes up to live in the temple. Okay, of course, she turns out to be the most sought after of all the virgins. And uh, the legend is whoever br brings their rods to the temple will win the hand of the Virgin Mary. So all the bachelors line up, they bring their rods to the temple and whose rod flowers? Joseph. Yesterday was St. Joseph Day, in fact, um, appropriately. And not only does it flower, but a dove lands on top of it and he wins the hand of the Virgin Mary and she's betrothed to him. And these characters, you can see how angry these uh, bachelors are. They're all breaking their rods over their knees. It's all phallic in the end. But now Jolto's able to give you a feeling of frustration and anger. This guy's saying, oh, you old man, you have no right to be with such a young, beautiful bride. And then we move to the other side. Now I've gone through one side and I'm looping around and we come to the Annunciation. Remember Annunciation, the whole thing is dedicated to the Annunciation. And here's Gabriel who announces to Mary that she'll become pregnant with Christ. Look at how Giotto um, depicts the scene. Uh, the, the angel has landed. And then Giotto does this interesting thing with the curtains. He pulls the curtains open, ties them up in this elegant way. And we follow that curtain. And then look, he gives us another curtain that comes out of the window on the top. Then our eye follows that over to another curtain that comes down to another tie curtain. He's using this motif to pull us from one side of the arch to the other. Let me show you. There it is. We're right here. Boom, over to the Virgin Mary who is um, receiving the Holy Spirit. And also notice her physiognomy has changed. She no longer looks like that shy young girl. She looks more like the queen of heaven who is taking on her fate. Uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Here I am, handmaiden to the Lord. She's accepting, she's humble, and she is um, surprised. Our next embrace on, uh, uh, excuse me, Elizabeth and the Virgin Mary. Elizabeth is the mom of John the Baptist, and they're both pregnant, Mary with Christ, Elizabeth with John the Baptist, and they embrace two women uh, in solidarity come together. And then, of course, Mary gives birth to Christ. This is called the Nativity. Joseph is here, falling asleep, missed the whole thing. And here on the left, you can see the ox and the ass who look on towards this image. This is our next embracing moment. Look, oh, isn't that beautiful? Look at the love between mother and child and how Giotto has captured that just perfectly. Christ looks right up. He already seems to have so much wisdom. He's tightly swaddled as they would be immediately after they were born. Babies were laid out, the limbs straightened and then tightly swaddled to make sure that the limbs grew straight and true. Mary leans towards him in this gaze. Also, there is a sense of almost sadness to her face as if she knows what's going to befall her son. Look at the details, everyone. How Giotto has covered her hair in this translucent um, kind of scarf. The blue has flaked off of her, uh, her garment, but you can see it was like the queen of heaven. Absolutely beautiful. And the three magi come to uh, worship the Christ child. Interesting detail here um, is you can see the star that comes flying through. And it turns out that right when this thing was painted, there was a comet that went over Italy at that time. And some art historians believe that this is Giotto's rendition of that particular comet. I don't know what the comet was called, but here's another embracing scene. Now Joseph and um, the Virgin Mary have to get out of town because 
Uh, every firstborn child has been uh, called to be slaughtered and they escape into Egypt. And mother and child are embracing. Now Mary looks completely determined. She's going to take her child out of danger. Joseph looks a little bit um, disconcerted. But what's interesting about this is that Giotto uses the background. See, the, the landscape in the background supports the figures in the foreground. So we get these two mountains that come up behind her, anchoring the figures uh, below. It, it, it almost makes it look aerodynamic, how you move from left to right. And then, of course, you have the massacre of the innocents, a terrible scene of these poor mothers who are holding desperately on to their children. And... Um, they're relentless, uh, trying to kill every firstborn uh, to stop that um, child from growing up to see the fall of um, the empire. This detail is just incredible. Look at the woman crying out. And Giotto has painted a streak here, see, of tears. Look at the lines around her face. You can see inside her mouth, she's red with fear, that poor child. Now, nobody was going to see that. Nobody can see that detail from down below looking up. But Giotto wants to make it as naturalistic as possible, and he really succeeds. Okay, Christ grows up, and now we get to what's called the passion. Uh, here he is multiplying the loaves and uh, the, the barrels. I like this detail because the barrels of wine match up with this big guy's uh, big tummy uh, showing. It's just, you know, giving a little bit of fun. He uses the shapes in the paintings to, you know, like the aerodynamic um, uh, mountains to support it. Or here are these jugs, which repeat the, the rotund figure here, sipping the wine. And then it's Palm Sunday, of course coming into uh, Beth, um, Jerusalem, and the children are pulling down, in this case, uh, not palm trees, but more, uh, more Italian trees, which are olive trees, and laying them down. Uh, these people are so excited about Christ coming in. Uh, you can see they just can't get their sweaters off fast enough to lie down, to lay down in front of Christ as he comes in. And here's our detail of these figures pulling down the um, olive branches which is traditional. Uh, I think Palm Sunday is actually coming up soon. And then um, the betrayal of Judas, who will, of course, betray Christ for 30 silver pieces. Who's making him do it? The devil. Now, here's our next embracing scene. So we started off with an embrace of an old age couple with concern, uh, two women in solidarity, a mother and a child. And now the embrace of complete jealousy and betrayal. This is one of the greatest paintings in the history of art, right there. Giotto, Kiss of Judas. Christ stands very straight in a noble profile, looking right into the eyes of Judas. Judas lifts up his yellow robes of jealousy and he gives Christ a big smack. Look, look at the facial expression, his heavy brow over his eyes. Seems like his eyeballs are rolling backwards. Giotto's put the faces of these Roman soldiers in between to give it this sinister feel. Eyes, eyes, eyes all around the figure. And Christ looks so handsome and calm into the eyes of Judas, as if to say, I know what you're going to do. Let's go back. And then all around them, an explosion of, of, of swords and, and um, poles and, and torches, like exclamation points all around them. See, he's using this calm moment of Christ and Judas, and then this cacophony of figures moving and gesticulating. Look, here's, here's uh, Peter cutting off the ear of a Roman soldier. Here's a, a Roman priest reaching up and pointing. Ah, oh, what a painting. What a painting that is. And then, of course, we come to the end of Christ's life. Um, the human emotion on these grieving angels. The lamentation. Here's our last embracing scene where Mary holds her dead child in her arms. 
He's already going into rigor mortis. As you see, even the color of Christ's body is kind of a gray green. The landscape swoops down and brings us right to the face of Mary and Christ. Powerful, powerful image. Now we come to last judgment in these last five minutes. I'll take you through with the last judgment, Christ bringing up the blessed with his right hand and casting down the wicked with his left. He's in this rainbow mandala form. The end of time, the heaven gates are being unrolled by these militant angels. And here we have the elect along with the angels as if they're in bleacher seats being brought up. Look at how militant they are. And here are the ones who are going up into heaven, being ushered in by these angels. Some of them are in military garb. Many is cl uh, clergy. This is probably St. Anthony. I'm sorry, uh, St. Dominic, uh, St. Francis, St. Augustine, uh, characters from history. And these little funny characters here on the lower left-hand side, um, those are figures who died before Christ could die for their sins. So their bodies are coming out of the sepulcher and their bodies are, are uh, the flesh is coming back on their bodies. Here's some more details. Well, D Giotto painted it. So sure enough, Giotto is going to be included in the elect. He's right here. I don't think he looks so ugly myself. And that's supposed to be uh, Dante uh, next to him and all of these characters from Padua. Then here is the wow. There is, of course, hell where the uh, punished are being tossed down into different areas of hell with all kinds of horrible tortures going on. Looks almost like a Hieronymus Bosch, which would be painted, you know, 300 years later. Um, here at the very bowels of hell is the devil himself. He's going to eat three figures. He eats Judas, Cassius, and Brutus. He eats them, he digests them, and then he excretes them down below. And here's some details of the punishments of hell. What did you do in this life? Were you vain? Were you gluttonous? Were you usurous? Were you violent? All the different sins, there are, a, there, there are special kinds of tortures waiting for you in the next uh, world. These quite um, painful looking to say the least. 1305, everybody. But then remember, the whole function of this chapel is to expiate the sin of usury. So here, the lower left-hand side, you can see two figures, and you recognize immediately this chapel, that's the arena chapel. And this guy holding it up, that's Enrico Scroveni, the one that Dante put into hell. And here is, um, sorry, and Reginaldo Scrivani. And over here is his son, Enrico, who's trying to get dad's soul out of hell. And therefore, he presents it to the Virgin of Charity. And that's what you see um, on the left-hand side. The whole function is the expiation of the sin of usury. Then last images to show you are a series of virtues and vices on either side of the wall uh, that are fascinating. Here on the left, prudencia, prudence. You see this, and they're female figures because of the Latin word, prudencia. It ends with an A. It's not that, you know, he's thinking somehow of glorifying the female rate, uh, the, the women. Then on the right-hand side, you can see um, that's invidia. Invidia means uh, envy. So envious. See, his ears are big. He's listening. This tongue comes out and bites himself right between the eyes. And he's holding on to a, a, a sack of money and burning with envy. Or uh, this is justitia. It's a world run by a woman. I like that. And you can see that she's just with punishment and reward. And here down below is the world that's run uh, in a just way. People are on horseback. Things are growing. There's dancing. There's building. Uh, everybody seems to be uh, calm. And she is 
distributing justice. Now here's injustice, which I think is interesting because Giotto puts a man up there, injustizia, everything's overgrown, he is violent, he's running things uh, with these deadly pick and uh, a longobardo, and here women are being carried off by the hair, horses are rearing up, and of course it's the armor um, makers who are uh, flourishing at this time. Then we have uh, on this left-hand side, this is going to be, um, oh, what is it, patience on the left-hand, um, prudence, temperance, sorry, thank you. Couldn't think of it in English, a temperance. So she's closing up a sword and over here is infidelity. This character is being tied by the throat to a woman. And then we get hope and of course, despair. And then we have caritas or charity and, um, oh, in, in Vidya again. So those uh, give us the virtues and the vices of what I really think are the most, one of the most important decorative monuments in all of Italy. And if you like this presentation and you want to join me on a Sunday, uh, I do presentations every Sunday. Just go to elaineruflo.com and you'll see a whole series of uh, art, culture, uh, presentations. Um, this Sunday, tomorrow, I'll be talking about the young Michelangelo. And then on Tuesdays, I do pr I have my guest lecturers come in and do what I find interesting presentations. This coming Tuesday will be a lecture on Bernard Berenson. So with that, I will stop my share. And thank you very much, David, for letting me go over the hour. I appreciate that. And um, I'll do this. Well, Elaine, I think we have a few questions. Okay. Once again, a marvelous presentation. We're just always so happy to hear I from you. I feel like I'm at home in Padua. I really do. Well, it seems like it. I'd like to see Padua with you someday. Oh, great. Um, I'm going to start off a question. We have a couple coming from our audience today as well. Um, first of all, just quickly, and you mentioned it briefly, but maybe you can go in a little more detail. How does Vasari or how do others of the time really credit Giotto for his advances? He is clearly at Scrovini, he's moved the bar substantially yeah. from where painting has been before. Mm -hmm. Is it noticed? Are people paying attention? Yeah, it's not just Vasari who writes about that. It's also his contemporaries. And we know this, um, when I say they're writing about this, sometimes it can be written about in a treatise. But sometimes it can also be noted in something called a ricordanza, which is a diary. People will write about things. Boccaccio talks about him, Dante, Vasari, Ghiberti. I mean, it's clear that he's made the major break. And we saw it with our own eyes. I mean, it's um, it changes. But, you know, Giotto doesn't exist in a vacuum. Giotto is a product of the times. This is the time of the rise of city-states. It's also when you start to see the attention to this world, right? Fr St. Francis's preachings are, uh, 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 are going around like wildfire. And um, the economy is booming. Even Dante's writing in the vernacular. So all of this is a reflection of this huge change that occurs right at the beginning of the 14th century. So fascinating. Um, can you relate um, quickly the dimensionality of the Scrivini Chapel versus the Sistine Chapel. I mean, oh, we're yeah, talking about two rectangular rooms. They're obviously different uh, sizes, but yeah, a right. lot of similarities, right? Right. I would say the Arena Chapel would be about half the size of the um, Sistine Chapel. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Marie Harper asks, given the number of rivers and the relative proximity to the Adriatic, have there been issues over the years with humidity and the frescoes at the Scrivini Chapel? Yeah, that was, Marie, that was the issue. That's why they did this major restoration. They did a beautiful job on it. And that's why now they are um, very careful how many people can come in at one time. You can only go in 25 people at one time. So when you go to the Arena Chapel, what one does, or what I do, is I book two back-to-back -back visits because they only allow you inside for uh, 12 minutes. And if you want to try to take your time and try to at least see it for a bit, you've got to do two bookings and they're nice. They don't make you leave and come back again. So if I go with like, you know, the Muscarelli, we do the Padua, I would book three visits in a row 
you know, pay the three tickets and then stay in there for the whole time. Got it. Interesting. John Fogarty asks, um, how did Ravenna relate to Padua? John Fogarty, hello. Uh, Ravenna's much earlier. Ravenna's heyday is 402 when the capital was moved there under Honorius. And um, the Byzantine, then Ravenna becomes the Western outpost of the Eastern Empire. Now that's confusing. Uh, but the heyday of Ravenna is 402 to 700, maybe even that's late. Um, so Ravenna, during this time of Giotto, is run by a family called the Da Polenta family. And they're the ones that actually uh, host Dante as well. And Dante's buried in Ravenna. So your question is a good one. But not much is going on in Ravenna uh, during that time. Ravenna's day in the sun was around 500. Interesting. Well, Elaine, I want to thank you for being with us today. We really look forward to the next time you'll join us again, and we'll have to get that all scheduled. Um, I want to thank Laura Fogarty for being the producer of today's program, one of our staff team members at the Muscarelli. And of course, I want to thank all of you, our members. We do this for you. We love to be on the journey through art and architecture and art history with all of you, and we hope you enjoy these programs. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend and we look forward to seeing you soon. Goodbye, Elaine in Italy. Have a wonderful evening and I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. So long. Ciao, everyone.